All right, Pastor Lexi was so excited about making that video. She did such a good job. She is always serving in kids' ministry. Yeah, let's give Pastor Lexi a round of applause. I told her she's always in the kids' ministry, so she has to do something to get herself in this space with us, right? Pastor Lexi does such a great job serving as our children's pastor. I'm so grateful for her. But if you're new today, just want to kind of echo what she was saying. I just hope you feel so connected here. and just want to encourage you to, to get connected. Don't be a stranger. If you want to make this place your home at some point, I pray that you would really jump in and, and be connected. We want to know you. We want to uh, be your friend. So thanks for being here today. And if this is your first time again, I just want to say thanks for taking the time to be here. But I also want to encourage everyone who calls Scent Church home or is considering calling Scent Church home to take the Activate class. The Activate class is really like our onboarding class for people who want to make this church their home. It's going to help you understand our DNA. It's going to give you some foundational pieces of following Jesus in the context of community and living on mission. It's going to teach you how to live on mission, how to be in Christian community. And at the end of the class, you're going to have an opportunity to commit to partnering with us and to say officially that, uh, that this place is your home. We're calling it church partnership. So this idea that the people who who call this place home, our church partners. You're a part of this church. You are committing to make this place your home. That class is kind of the prerequisite for that. So I just want to encourage you to consider taking that class if this place is home, and I don't think you'll regret it. I mean, the least that's going to happen is you're going to get free food for four weeks. So praise God for that. It's going to be so good. All right, so this morning we're going to continue our Gospel of Mark sermon series. We're in chapter 6 today, and we are in week 26 of the series. And in the last few weeks, we've seen that Jesus' ministry is really picking up steam, okay? So Jesus, he, he sends out his disciples at the beginning of chapter 6 on their first mission. They go out two by two, they preach, they cast out demons, they heal people, and then King Herod hears about Jesus' ministry, and we got a window into what happened with John the Baptist as he was beheaded after King Herod's wife encouraged him to do that. So uh, John the Baptist has, has taken on the wrath of the kingdom, and then Jesus goes and he feeds 5,000 men with only five loaves and two fishes. And we saw last week in that story that the 5,000 were hoping that Jesus would lead a revolution against Rome and set up a kingdom on earth. Instead of doing that, Jesus taught them and fed them. He, he did this to show them what kind of leader he came to be. He didn't come to be a military leader. He didn't come to be a political leader, but the good shepherd who would lovingly guide them and fill their needs. And, and we saw that we're each called to be shepherded by Jesus. We're each called into that, and we're called to help other people be shepherded by Jesus as well. And now this week, we're going to pick it up right after that story. So Jesus, he, he feeds 5,000 people. He teaches them. And then this is what it says in verse 45. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray and when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat or got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did, not or they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And when they had crossed over, they came to, the, or to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick, in the marketplace and implored them that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many that touched it were made well. Okay, so the title of the sermon this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, it helps you not fall asleep when you take notes, right? In Jesus' name, let's take those notes. The sermon title is Struggle and Revelation, Struggle and Revelation. Let me pray for our sermon before we jump in. So Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for every heart that's here. God, I pray that every single person that steps through these doors this morning would be encouraged and challenge to be the person that you called them to be. God, I pray that this word would not be just lofty words of wisdom or good ideas, but it would be a demonstration of your spirit's power. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the summer of 2019, I began to sense that the Lord was calling us to plant a new church in the Cedar Valley. 
At the time, we were the Chi Alpha Campus pastors at UNI, and God was doing really incredible things on the campus, but, but we were just sensing that the Lord was transitioning us. He was taking his call off of Chi Alpha for us and calling us into planting a church in the Cedar Valley that shares Chi Alpha's DNA. After receiving confirmation through several different means, on October 14th of 2019, we officially committed to planting the church. And in the following few months were a season of intense struggle. Within 48 hours of deciding to plant the church, I came down with mono, and that took me out for about a month. That was not fun. And in the meantime, we also faced relational difficulties as some struggled with this idea of us planting a church. Uh, we faced insecurity. So I'm just going to be honest. It's kind of an insecure thing to say, hey, I'm starting a church. Come let me be your pastor, right? And then people decide to come or not, right? So, so that, was, that brought out some insecurities in my own heart specifically, but also in Emily's as you're asking people to join you and you don't know what they're going to do. At the same time, we had to steward the passing on of leadership of, of Chi Alpha to the next generation. And this is, you know, when COVID's happening, passing it on to Pastor Derek, who, who's doing a great job. At the time, was only 23, had just barely graduated college himself. Now he's taking over an established Chi Alpha, trying to lead it into the future. And at the same time, we had to navigate planning a church in the midst of COVID. And we had never navigated this many complicated things at once. On top of this, we had to navigate all the normal difficulties that come with planting a church. And, and one of those challenges is finding a place to meet in for Sunday morning services. In the spring of 2020, we began to take, or take some steps to find our location. And this building was for sale at the time, but we also had no money. Okay, so how does that work? No money, building, I don't know. So what I did is I asked the, the previous pastor to give us the building, and that didn't work out. But hey, I tried. Okay, you can't say I didn't walk by faith. But after months of trying to secure this building and even trying for a couple others in town, uh, we decided to look for a portable location until we could have more resources to purchase a building. Everywhere we turned shut us down. The schools, movie theaters, everywhere we tried to find a place to meet portably shut us down. At this point, it was the middle of May, and the clock was ticking as we were planning to launch our church in September and start having preview services in August. After trying for every portable location I could think of, I figured I would go to my last resort. There's this place, I won't say it out loud, but this place that was like, it's my last resort. I know if I go there, they'll say yes. I knew that other church plants had met there before. So I, I set up a, a meeting with the owner of that building, and I was almost 100% sure that he would say yes. On May 15th, I went into that meeting. I was excited. I had these visions and pictures in my mind of us having church there. I was like, this is going to be Amazing. But to my surprise, he shot me down as well. He was not very excited about the idea of us meeting there, and he was actually a little harsh with me. I went home dejected and confused. I told Emily that night, I said, I have no favor from God. I feel like he's asked me to plant this church, but he's not helping me out at all. And I went to bed discouraged and confused and just thinking back on the previous five months. I'm like, this has already been a dogfight, and we haven't even had a service yet. What is God doing? Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt like you just can't catch a break, no matter how hard you try? Maybe you're doing something that God has asked you to do, but for whatever reason, it doesn't seem that he's, or seem like he wants to help you. It seems like the more you do what he says, the harder it gets. Or maybe you're starting to obey God in an area of your life, but it seems like you're moving upstream and everything is resisting you. Or maybe you've decided that you're going to center your life on Jesus, but for whatever reason, it seems like life just keeps throwing you curveballs. It seems like the more you follow him, the harder it gets. The reality is every follower of Jesus goes through struggles and experiences pain and resistance. In fact, there are times when the Lord himself will send us into struggles on purpose. There are many reasons why we face struggles, and that's not really the point of this sermon. You know, sometimes we experience our struggles because of the fallen world we live in, sometimes because of demonic opposition, and sometimes because of God's will. But again, that's a different sermon. The thing I want to look at today is how does God leverage our struggles for his purposes? In other words, what is God doing in the midst of the struggle? What is he doing in the midst of our struggles? What does God hope to accomplish through them? Our story, Mark, will help us drill down on that a bit today. As we talked about last week, if we're going to truly understand these stories and what Mark is trying to teach us through them, we need to understand the context in which they took place. 
a lot of times our struggle with interpretation of the scriptures, we go into it thinking they lived in 21st century America and read it through that lens. But instead, that's not what's going on. They are in their own context. They're dealing with their own issues. And we have to understand that context. Jesus had just gotten done feeding a crowd full of people who wanted him to lead a revolution against Rome. They didn't want a servant king who would die for their sins. Instead, they wanted a warrior king who would stand against Rome and lead a military campaign. And through feeding them and teaching them, Jesus was trying to show them what he came to do. He didn't come to set up a worldly kingdom that's achieved through the sword. But he came to set up a heavenly kingdom that's achieved through his broken body and shed blood. Despite his attempts to explain this through his teaching and through his miracle, the crowd did not understand. John ends his version of the story by saying this. It says this in John 6, 15. It says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Okay, so they're trying to take him by force. They're trying to make him their king. And then Mark's version of the story doesn't tell us that quite, but it does give us some other details about how Jesus ended his time with them. It says this in in 45 and 46. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Okay, so in the Greek here, there's an unusual urgency and forcefulness to the Greek words for immediately he made. He's essentially forcing the disciples to leave. He's like, get your tails out of here. He's pushing them out. Okay, so why did he do that? Well, it appears that Jesus was worried that the disciples themselves would get swept up into the fervor of the crowd. As scholar James Edwards says, the disciples were not unsusceptible to the messianic contagion of the crowd. Jesus wanted to remove them from the scene and send the crowd home before the disciples were led astray and things got out of hand. And following this, he retreats to pray. Okay, so Jesus, think about if you were Jesus. He has to be a little bit discouraged. Okay, so he's trying to teach these crowds. He's feeding them, and they still don't get the point. It seems like no matter where he goes, people just don't really get what he came to do. They think he came to be some warrior king, but Jesus came to save them from their sins. He's confused. He goes to the mountain. He needs to recenter himself on his mission and his calling as he needs to be encouraged by the Lord. Edward says that he needed to double down in prayer on the fact that he did not come to be a freedom fighter, but a servant. He needed to have that time to recenter himself. That's why he goes to the mountain. Okay, this story shows us how easy it is to misunderstand who Jesus is. The disciples had been with Jesus. They had been ministering with him. They had went out for him. They had preached his gospel. They had healed people in his name. And Jesus was still afraid that they would misunderstand him and his calling, so much so that he sent them out to the sea before they could get infected with this, or with these bad ideas that the crowd has. Okay, so with that said, the first thing I want you to write down this morning, it's easy to misunderstand who Jesus is. It's easy. It's not hard. It's easy to misunderstand who he is. And the same is true for us today. If the disciples could misunderstand Jesus, I think we can surely misunderstand Jesus. It's vital that we use the means that God has given us to understand him correctly. The primary means is his word, right? The word of God. It helps ground us. The word is our foundation. Everything we believe is filtered through the word of God. We don't come up with our own ideas. We filter it through the word of God. But another way that we can understand who God is is through his church. The church helps us as we come together. We can interpret the scriptures together. We can hold each other accountable and challenge our ways of thinking. So the word of God in the church are really the two primary ways where we can come to understand who Jesus is. But there's also another way that I think Mark is getting at here. It seems that Mark is telling us that there's another way that we can come to have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is. Well, let's keep reading our story to see what that is. In verse 47, it says this, And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. Okay, so it's interesting. After a long day, of ministering to these crowds together, Jesus sends his disciples out on the boat to only find themselves in another struggle, this time against the wind. I'm sure the disciples were thinking, Jesus, why would you send us out here just to struggle against the wind? Like, I've been canoeing a few times in my life, and it never goes well for me. It's like I go this way, and then I turn this way, and I can't get straight. So I can only imagine if there's, like, wind coming towards you, 
how hard it could be. And, you know, for me, this is just when I'm with a buddy and we can't get on the same page. You know, you're supposed to have one guy on this side, one guy on that side. Anyways, the point is the disciples are probably like, why would you send us out here just to struggle against the wind? It's important to note that this is not like the storm in Mark 4, okay? So this is not like a life-threatening storm where the boat's about to tip, but it is a strong wind and it's a difficult wind. Despite their best efforts, they can't seem to make any progress. And it's important to notice that it, it appears that Jesus sent them out there knowing that they would struggle. Okay, so this leads us to another important point. Jesus often sends us to the struggle. Jesus often sends us to the struggle. And we see this principle throughout both the Old and New Testaments, all throughout Scripture. It seems like God sometimes will send us to struggle on purpose. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham to leave his home and to become a father of a great nation. It's this glorious calling. He says, look at the stars in the sky. Your descendants are going to be more than the stars in the sky. But it takes decades for Abraham to have his son Isaac. He, he has to struggle. There's so much struggle between the promise and the fulfillment of that promise. In Exodus, God calls Moses to go and free the people of Israel from the grips of Egypt. And he, he goes and he says, you know, let my people go. And he does it over and over again. And Pharaoh keeps hardening his heart. There's a bunch of plagues that happen that get up against the Red Sea. God has to part the Red Sea. And then he takes them out in the wilderness. And the people are very disobedient, very rebellious. And for 40 years, he has to wander through the wilderness leading these hard-hearted people. The point is, Moses had to struggle. Moses had to uh, struggle greatly before he could take the people into the promised land. In First and Second Samuel, God called David to be the king of Israel. But then he spends much of his life both running from King Saul, who was the king before him, and then running from his own son Absalom, who tried to take the kingdom from him. In the New Testament, Jesus, before he launches his ministry, he has to struggle against the devil in the wilderness. We looked at that last summer in the Gospel of Mark. Paul, he's called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but it seems like everywhere he turns to plant a church, he faces demonic opposition, he faces intense struggle. In 2 Corinthians, he, he talks about how God gave him a thorn in the flesh, a thorn in the flesh from God. And we don't know exactly what the thorn was, but it was certainly difficult. And he asked God to take it away. And the Lord says this to him in verse 9. It says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, that I am content with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. In some mysterious way, the struggle was a special way for Paul to experience God's power and grace. I could go on, but the point is, Jesus will often lead us to a struggle. While he doesn't cause evil, so actually the thorn in the flesh is from Satan, but God allows it to stay, right? While God doesn't cause evil, he does allow us to be tested, and he does allow us to face trials. He doesn't always take the struggle away. The question is why? Why does God allow us to struggle? Why does he do this sometimes even purposefully? Why would God allow the kids he loves to struggle? Why would he allow this? Well, let's look at verse 48 through 51. It says this, and he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them and about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Okay, so as Jesus was praying, it appears that he was able to see the sea from the mountain, and he sees his disciples struggling, right? He sees them taking the canoe like this, boop, boop. He's like, I got to go help them out. Okay, it's the fourth watch of the night. It's between 3 and 6 a.m., and he decides to go walk on the water to the disciples. He's like, I'm not going to swim. It's easier just to walk. Okay, so he just walks to the disciples. It appears that the same compassion that compelled him to feed the crowds is now compelling him to go out to the, the, or to the disciples on the sea. But he has more in mind than simply helping them with their efforts to, to make progress on the water. He's seeking to reveal himself to the disciples. Okay, so by walking on the sea... He's giving them a glimpse into his divinity. As in the Old Testament, only God can walk on water. And Mark notes that Jesus intended to pass by them. Why would Jesus try to pass by them? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so Mark, he is drawing another comparison, or comparison between Jesus and God in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God passes by Moses and Elijah to reveal himself to them. 
Mark's making the point that Jesus is trying to reveal himself as God, and more specifically the Messiah, to his disciples. And while we would expect the disciples to be encouraged by Jesus coming to them on the sea, they start freaking out. They think he's a ghost. They think he's some type of sea demon that's come to eat them or something. They, they are freaked out. And to that, he reassures them. He says, take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. Okay, so it's easy in the English to miss the gravity of what Jesus is saying here. In the Greek, this it is I statement is the same thing that God said to Moses when he revealed himself to Moses. And not just that, but in the Old Testament, whenever the phrase it is I is coupled with a call to take heart or to not fear. It's always a way that God reveals himself to people. As you can see here, with each chapter of Mark, a clearer picture of Jesus is being drawn. There's a tension growing with each miracle. Sick people are healed. Demons are driven out. The hungry are fed. Storms are calmed and winds are stilled. As the disciples ask in Mark chapter 4, we're supposed to ask, I think Mark is trying to get us to ask the question, who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? And this buildup of Jesus' identity won't climax until Mark chapter 8 when Peter explicitly says that he's the Christ or the Messiah. But Mark is making it pretty clear right now. In Jesus, God has come to do what Israel could never do. He has come to be the obedient and faithful human being. He's come to restore this world once and for all, but he's not going to do it through force. He's not going to do it through the ways we think he should do it. He's going to do it by dying and rising again. In his death and resurrection, he will disarm the rulers of this world, defeat death and sin once and for all, and become the true king of the world. In the midst of the disciples' str struggle against the wind, they get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Jesus is showing the disciples that he is the Messiah who has come to put the world right. In the same way, it's in the struggle that God reveals himself to us. It's in the struggle. We don't just get a picture of who God is through the scriptures and through the church, but also through our struggles. The struggle is the place of revelation. The struggle is the place of revelation. This has been true all throughout the Gospel of Mark. Whenever the disciples face a struggle, whether that be lack of food, a crazy storm, a dead body, or a sick, needy person, they get a revelation of who Jesus is as he takes authority over those things. And the same is true for us. When we face struggles, this is where we get to see the face of God up close. I'm about to preach. Are you ready? I'm ready. Come on. This is where we get to see the face of God up close. Sometimes this can look like experiencing intimacy with him in a way that, or that we never have before. As we process through grief, toil, and pain, in some strange way we sense the nearness of Jesus who promises to be close to the brokenhearted. As I've shared before many times, when Emily and I experienced our miscarriage in 2017, it was the most intense grief season of our lives. But also, in a weird way, it was the season of, of the deepest intimacy with Jesus that, or that we had ever experienced up until that point. As we were driven to our knees in despair, we experienced the presence of God in a way that I'm convinced we could not have experienced if we were up on the mountaintop. And we can also experience revelation in our struggles by seeing God move in power. As we see him handle our struggles, we get to see the power of God. As we see God do what we feel like is impossible and move our mountains, we get to see his raw power. When the Lord finally came through and he gave us not only one, but three kids now in four years, we've seen his power in a way that we never had before. If we had not experienced the struggle of infertility and miscarriage, we would have never been able to see his power in this way. Struggle leads to revelation, both, or both revelation of God's intimacy and his nearness to us, but also revelation of his power. And we see this at the end of our story at the end, Mark makes an aside comment about how Jesus goes into the town and he heals a bunch of people, or the fringe of his garments healing people. We see here that sick people, as they come to Jesus with their sickness, their struggle is leading to revelation. Our struggles are the place of revelation. Get that in your bones this morning. Nothing, nothing is wasted in God's kingdom. Struggles have a purpose. Only Jesus can redeem our struggles. Come on. 
And James, he says it this way in chapter 1 of his book. He says, count it all joy. Joy? Do you really mean that, James? He says, joy, brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, so James says we can face trials with joy because it's the trial that grows us. They produce steadfastness in us so that we can mature. I love what he says in verse 4 when he says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. It's this idea that we have to let the steadfastness have its effect. We have to actually lean in during the trials and let God do what he wants to do instead of just trying to run from them. In 1 Peter 1, Peter says it this way. It's like the earlier church knew how to struggle, right? He says this. He says, in this you rejoice, though not for a little while, or though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says that trials are the place where our faith is proved genuine. It's the place where our faith becomes real. I don't know what you faced in the past. I don't know what you're facing now, and I don't know what you'll face in the future. But when you get out on that water, and you're struggling against that wind, and Jesus seems to be taking a nap on a mountain, don't miss what he's trying to do. He's trying to reveal himself to you. He wants to come to you in the midst of the struggle. Just as God revealed his identity to Moses in the burning bush while Moses was going through the struggle of exile, God wants to give you your burning bush moments. And sometimes those can only come in the midst of exile or in the midst of the struggle. But you have to have eyes to see what God is doing. You have to get your eyes off your problem and your eyes on God. Even in the midst of your pain, experience his presence as he draws near to you. Even in the midst of impossible circumstances, ask God in faith to move your mountains so that you can see his power in a new way. With this in mind, if our struggles are the place of revelation where God shows himself to be God, then what are our struggles supposed to teach us? What's the whole point? What are they supposed to teach us? Well, verse 51 and 52 give us a glimpse. It says this, And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Okay, so the disciples, they respond to Jesus, his stilling of the wind and walking on the water with complete amazement. It says they're utterly astounded. They are blown away, which makes sense rationally speaking, right? People don't walk on water. If someone walks on water, I'm going to be amazed and I don't want to get rebuked for it. You're supposed to laugh. It's okay, though. But <laughs> you're all looking at me like, man, I want to go back to bed. But anyways, but, <laughs> but Mark says something very important when he explains why they are amazed. He says, for they, did not under, or for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus had already calmed the storm. He had fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. He had raised a dead girl. He had healed dozens of people. And yet they were still being amazed by him. Because why? Because their hearts were hard. They hadn't learned the lesson that their struggles were supposed to teach them. Up until this point in the gospel... Hardened hearts have only been attributed to outsiders. But now Mark is calling the disciples outside. Or Mark is calling the disciples hard-hearted. He's saying that their hearts are hard because they still didn't trust Jesus as Messiah yet. Despite all the marvelous things he had done, their hearts still did not trust him because their hearts had yet to be changed. And Mark is saying that Jesus can do miracles in our lives all day. But if our hearts are hard, then we still won't trust him. Our hearts need to be changed. We have to get to a point where the revelations we receive of Jesus actually change our hearts and cause us to trust him in the future. We need to get to a point where no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what happens, we can have unshakable peace and confidence because we know who Jesus is. And we know that he's the same God who promised Abram that he would be the father of a, of a great nation and came through on that promise. He's the same God who freed the Israelites from Egypt. He's the same God who came in Jesus and he died and he rose again on our behalf. And if he's that God, if he's the same God who died and rose again, if he's the same God who's come through for us in the past, 
then we can trust him no matter what. With all that said, God wants to use our struggles to reveal himself to us. He wants to use our struggles to, or to soften our hearts and, and to teach us to trust him in the future as he comes through on our behalf. Okay, so the main idea this morning is this. As Jesus reveals himself to us in our struggles, we must learn to trust him no matter what we face. That's the whole point. Revelation, which leads to trust, which means next time you face a struggle, you won't be freaking out anymore because you know who God is. You know who Jesus is. Jesus wants us to get to a point where no matter what we face, no matter what happens, we trust him. The disciples had experienced one of the greatest miracles in history the day before, and yet they were freaked out when Jesus walked on water. And again, the only explanation for this is their hearts were just hard. They didn't trust Jesus. We must allow what Jesus has done for us in the past to soften our hearts so that we can trust him in the future. Let's not make the same mistake as these disciples. My personal goal in life is to get to a point where no matter what I face, no matter how hard my situation is, I have a firm trust in God because I've seen him move in my life in the past and I know what he's done on the cross and in the resurrection. I want to get to a point where I trust him no matter what comes my way. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm a work in progress. I'm praying that God could help me get there, where I can just have this unshakable peace and trust no matter what's going on in the world. As I shared earlier, October 2019 to May 2020 was one of the most challenging seasons of my life. And I believe one of the greatest challenges in those seasons was trying to find a home for our church. I stressed out way too much about that. Again, I was already struggling with insecurity because I was leaving everything I had known to venture into this new journey of church planting. And I desperately just wanted a home for our church to make me feel a little bit secure. That's where it was coming from. Like, God, give me some sense of security. I'm out here on the water. Just give me a place for our church to meet. On the night of May 16th, after going to my last resort, getting shot down the day before, I went to sleep and I was just undone before God that night before bed. I remember saying, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, I knew that if God wanted this church plant to happen, then, or then he needed to take over. I dropped my oar in the water, so to speak, and I said, Jesus, if we're getting to the other side, you've got to be the captain of this boat. At 3 a.m. the next morning, God woke me up in the middle of the night, and I felt urged to search for convention centers in town on my phone. And sure enough, I found the Hilton Garden Inn. I don't know how I missed it before, but I found the Hilton Garden Inn in Cedar Falls. On Monday, I called them, and they were more excited about us coming than we were about going there. That's how excited they were because it was COVID season, and they're like, we don't got anybody. And they gave us an incredible deal, like an insane deal for us to meet there. And by the end of the week, we had a signed contract. But that only came after I surrendered to God and said, Jesus, you can just captain this boat. You can take it over. I trust you. You got this. I can't do it anymore. And a year after that, well, not even a year after that, we purchased this building. And we raised over $100,000 for a down payment. We raised another $100,000 for renovations. What did I learn through this struggle of finding a home for our church? Well, I learned that Jesus is the captain of Scent Church. Jesus is the provider of Scent Church. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on. Jesus is the church planter. That's written on my whiteboard in my office. Jesus is the church planter. He is the pastor of this church. He knows what he's doing, and he has our back. Not me. I'm not the one who takes care of Scent Church. I, I'm entrusted to steward it, but, but Jesus is the captain of this ship. Even when things are hard, and this applies to our lives as well, Jesus is the captain of, of our ships. He's the captain of our hearts. And since then, I've navigated other struggles in my own life and as a pastor, but each time he reveals himself to me and my trust for him begins to broaden and grow. And my hope again is that my heart would get to a place where I never doubt him again. Throw the most impossible odds at me. Throw the hardest thing at me. I am not going to be shaken because I know who my God is. I know how he's come through for me in the past and he will come through for me again. Because he's the God who secured the Hilton, because he's the God who got us this building, because he's the God who gave us baby Jane, because he's the God who set me free of my addictions, because he's the God who baptized me in the Holy Spirit, because he's the God who saved me from my sin, I can trust him no matter what comes my way. Come on. Because he's come through in the past, because he's revealed himself to me, I can trust him for the future. This is the Lord's heart for you. 
He wants to prove himself to you so much so that, that when you face your own struggle, you can just quietly trust him. You know that he's watching over you from the mountain and that he will come to be with you. He will come to calm the wind with just a word. As I wrote this sermon, I prayed about a couple applications for this group. And I felt like the Lord gave me three specific applications. I hope one of them applies to you. If it doesn't, just apply it to your own life. Okay, so maybe this morning you come in and you're struggling at your job. It just doesn't feel right for you. Or maybe you're dealing with a really difficult coworker or boss. And the Lord wants you to know that he has a purpose for you in that struggle. He wants to help you become more like him. And he wants to teach you to trust him. He may lead you to a different job. He may lead you to a different circumstance at your job. But I think most importantly, he wants to reveal himself to you by walking with you through the struggle if you allow him to. Or maybe you come in this morning and you're struggling with a broken relationship. You're at odds with someone. I wanna say this morning that Jesus has a purpose in your pain. He wants to reveal his enemy love to you. Even though that person has hurt you, even though you don't understand how they could do what they did, Jesus wants to give you his heart for them. He wants to give you his enemy love. And the only way you can learn enemy love is if you've got some enemies, right? He wants to teach you to love that difficult person. But not just that, he wants you to know that he sees you in your pain. He sees what you've been through and he's with you. He wants you to lean into him this morning. Or maybe you come in and you're just struggling financially. This morning, hear this, Jesus is your provider. Jesus is your provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Do your part. Be faithful to tithe. That's why we teach tithe. We don't teach the tithe because we want something from you. It's because we want something for you. Okay, be faithful to do your part. But as you do your part, just watch God supply every need of yours. It says that in Philippians, that he will supply every need of yours. Trust him. He will do it. I could go on and on. We could do this all day. Jesus will come through. He has a purpose in your struggle. He has a purpose in your pain. And the purpose is to reveal himself to you in a way that he can't when everything is going well. Allow that to happen. Allow Jesus to reveal himself to you. Get a glimpse of the Son of God this morning. And as he reveals himself, learn to trust him in the future. Let him change your heart. I pray that every person at Scent Church would be people who have soft hearts. Lord, let it never be said of us that we have hard hearts. Let him soften your heart this morning. If we can be a church of soft-hearted people who actually trust Jesus, there's no stopping what God wants to do. If we can be a church that, that struggles well and trust Jesus in the midst of the struggle, he will use us in ways that, that we could never imagine. As we trust Jesus in the struggle, we will persevere. We will grow into the likeness of Christ in the midst of our struggles. And as he comes through on our behalf, we will see our trust exponentially grow over time. And as this happens, we will be a testimony to a watching world. And people will come to know Jesus because of our unshakable trust. That's the call this morning. If we could stand to our feet, we're going to close. We're going to respond to God here this morning. We can bring the lights down, yeah. All right. The prayer team's going to be available up here. I just have one way to respond this morning. If you want to just bow your heads and close your eyes, I just want to give you a chance. If you are going through something today, you know, maybe it's a struggle that I spoke to or something else, I want to give you a chance to just put that before Jesus. I'm going to give you a chance to have him reveal himself to you in the midst of this struggle. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to count to three. And when I do, I just want you to slip up your hand just telling Jesus, hey, I got a struggle and I need you to reveal yourself to me in the midst of this struggle. Okay, so one, two, three. Slip up your hands all across the room. I see tons of hands going up. Just to tell Jesus, hey, I got something going on, and I need you to reveal yourself to me in the midst of this. All right, so I'm just going to pray for us right now, and then we'll have a chance to respond in worship. So Jesus, right now, for those that are going through something, I pray that you would come out on the water to them and speak to them. Take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. And that you would calm the wind in their life. Jesus, I pray that our... Our struggles would not be wasted, but instead that you would reveal yourself to us in the midst of the struggle. I pray that in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our weakness, you would reveal yourself to us. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just another way to respond to it, if you feel led, if you're going through something, come to the altar and just get with Jesus. We got about five, 
You have five or so minutes here to respond to God in worship. I just want to encourage you to take advantage of this time to get along with God at the altar. All right, we're going to worship.